This is the first in a series of eight lectures on the doctrine of Christ. You remember, as you look over your notes, we will study uh, during the course of the Liberty Home Bible Institute a total of 12 doctrines. Doctrine of the Father, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of prophecy, many of these you already have taken. But without doubt, the most important of these 12 is the one that we are to study now, the doctrine of Christ. It has been estimated that some 40 billion individuals have lived upon this earth since Adam. That is to say, those that are now living or that have lived. And what a contrast can be seen in this vast multitude of humanity. Now this number would include black men and white men, brown and yellow men, and these men have explored and settled every corner of their earth. And of course, they speak dozens of languages and practice multitudes of religions and have formulated numerous cultures. But you stop to think that every single human being in this 40 billion number shares one vital thing in common. Their purpose of life down here and their eternal destiny afterwards depends completely upon their personal relationship with the subject of this study, the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about it now. The eternal destiny of every one of these 40 billion people depends upon their relationship to one man, the man, Christ Jesus. And so it is therefore absolutely impossible to overemphasize or overexaggerate the importance of the life of Jesus Christ. The key question of the universe continues to be, what think ye of Christ? Matthew 22 Verse 42, during the next seven lectures after this one, we will study his life. Actually, we'll study his person and work. This will not be a biographical, bi biographical study on the life of Christ as such, but we shall study his, his work and his person along the following 19 areas. And I'll go through these rapidly with you now. So we can see what's ahead around the road here, or around the corner, as it were, in the road of our study of the doctrine of Christ. We'll look at his pre-existence, his Old Testament ministry, his virgin birth incarnation, some of the biblical names for Christ, the humanity of our Lord, the deity of our Lord, his impeccability, his inability to sin, the earthly ministry of Christ, and here I'll briefly uh, take you through 48 important events transpiring during the 34-year stay here on earth, the character of Jesus, the biographers who study, who write about his life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then his kenosis, his divine emptying, in Philippians chapter 2, the offices that Christ held or is holding or will hold, and then his death, his descent into the heart of the earth, his glorious resurrection, his ascension and present ministry, and then his twofold coming, the rapture and the revelation, the millennial reign of Christ, and the various Old Testament witnesses to the person and work of Christ. Jesus said, of course, search the scriptures for they speak of me. Someone has said concerning the person of Christ, to the artist, he is the one altogether lovely. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 15. To the architect, he is the chief cornerstone. 1 Peter 2, 6. To the astronomer, he is the son of righteousness, Malachi 4.2. To the baker, he is the bread of life, John 6.35.
To the banker, he is the hidden treasure, Matthew 13, 44. To the builder, he is the sure foundation, Isaiah 28, 16. To the carpenter, he is the door, John 10, 7. To the doctor, he is the great physician, Jeremiah 8, 22. To the educator, he's the great teacher, John 3, 2. To the engineer, he is the new and living way, Hebrews 10, 20. And to the farmer, he is the sower and the Lord of harvest, Luke 10, 2. Now, with this introduction, we plunge immediately into this all-important study of the person and work of Christ by, first of all, looking at his pre-existence, and I should say his pre-existence as God, because it is possible, as some have done, for example, the Jehovah Witnesses, to hold to his pre-existence, or those who believe in reincarnation for that matter, without believing in his deity. But it is absolutely essential to note, and the Bible dogmatically declares, that he was not only pre-existent, but he was pre-existent as God and not some created angel, as again our Jehovah Witness friends would have us believe. This is totally unscriptural. All right, now this divine pre-existence is taught uh, by many verses in many books. Uh, John the Apostle teaches it. In fact, John the Baptist would preach that. In John chapter 1, verse 15, John the Baptist, this was part of his message in preparing for the Christ who would come and redeem people and take away the sins of the world. He spoke of his preexistence. In John 1.15, the Baptist says, He bore witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spoke. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Verse 27 of that same chapter, John continues, John the Baptist, He, he it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latchet I am not worthy to lose. And again, when he points him out in John 1, 29, he says, Behold the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. And in verse 30, he said, This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. What does that mean? Well, it means that Jesus existed before John the Baptist, and John the Baptist acknowledged that. You see, humanly speaking, as far as the flesh was concerned, John the Baptist was some six months older. That is to say, he was born to Elizabeth six months before the Savior uh, was, at least the body of the Savior, was born from the Virgin Mary. But here he says that he was before me. So this is taught by John the Baptist. And then, of course, it is taught by John the Apostle. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in 1 John 1, 2, John speaks of, of the one who existed from the beginning, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it's taught by the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2, the great Kenosis chapter, verses 6 through 8, speaking of Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, etc., and took upon himself the, the body of a slave. But who being in the form of God, speaking of his pre-existence, speaking of his deity before Bethlehem. And then also in Colossians chapter 1, uh, verses 15, 16, and 17, Paul speaks uh, dramatically and vividly of this pre-existence of Christ. We read these words, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn among every creature? So it speaks of him before the foundation of the world, the firstborn of every creature. And then the apostle Peter teaches the pre-existence of Christ, Peter says in chapter 1, verse 20, who verily was foreordained before 
the foundation of the world. And Jesus taught this in a number of passages. I'll just give you one. John 6, verse 38. Jesus says, I am come down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Notice, I am come down from heaven. Now, Concerning the activities of this divine pre-existent Christ, we've studied now the, briefly looked at the fact of it. Now, what was he doing before he created all things or before he, uh, uh, let me reword that, what was Jesus doing before Bethlehem? Well, number one, he was creating the universe. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, in Genesis 1, verse 1, we're told, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now, here Moses, who wrote the book of Genesis, tells us that this world was created, that the universe was created by God. But John tells us in his gospel that the world and universe was made by Christ. Now, who was right, John or Moses? Of course, the answer is both, because Jesus was God, and he created all things. So he was creating the universe before Bethlehem. Colossians 1, 16, again, from that passage, Paul says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, invisible and visible, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So he was creating the universe. Secondly, he was controlling this created universe. Hebrews chapter 1, uh, we're told, and verse 3, I believe it is, we'll turn to that, who, Paul says, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Upholding all things here by the word of his power, Paul says. And also again in Colossians uh, chapter 1 verse 17, and by him all things consist. So once he created the earth and he placed it some 93 million miles from the sun. Uh, then from that time on up to right now today, as we make and then as you listen to these tapes, he is controlling that distance. You know, if the earth uh, would uh, sort of stray a few more million miles from the sun in its orbit around the sun, we would freeze to death. And if the earth would uh, suddenly venture too close to the sun, get a few million miles closer to it, we would all boil away. But here we're told that he created the universe and now he controls this created universe. So he was creating, he is controlling, and the third thing that he was doing, he was communing with the Father, having fellowship with God the Father, before he created man even, and certainly before Bethlehem. John 17, Jesus asked the Father to restore to him the glory that they once had before the foundation of the world. So the activities of this divine pre-existence Christ, a uh, pre-existent Christ, was creating, controlling, and communing. Now, Secondly, the Old Testament ministry of Jesus Christ. These three that I've given you took place even before the Old Testament was written. But now what about the Old Testament ministry of Christ? Well, the Old Testament records a number of theophanies or Christophanies. Now, a theophany or a Christophany is simply stated a pre-Bethlehem appearance of Christ. That is to say... Our Lord was very busy uh, long before he joined himself to that little body developing within the womb of Mary. And most Bible theologians hold that the oft-appearing angel of the Lord episodes in the Old Testament are to be identified with Christ himself. Now that bothered me at first when I studied that uh, years ago because 
I thought, well, now, wait a minute. Our Lord is certainly more than an angel. But the Hebrew word for angel is malak, and it simply means a messenger from God. Now, it can mean uh, a, an angelic message as we th messenger, as we think of angels having wings, etc. But often it is a reference to Jesus himself. Isaiah calls Jesus my servant and uh, my messenger. So uh, here, uh, the angel of the Lord is God's special messenger in the Old Testament. So the promised Messiah of the New Testament was really God's messenger in the Old Testament. And a number of times we read the appearance of this angel of the Lord. So we're looking at now his Old Testament ministry. One of the first ministries at least one of the first, in fact, I believe the first time we read the expression, the angel of the Lord, appears in Genesis 16. And there was a woman, a young girl, a pregnant girl by the name of Hagar, Abraham's uh, mistress, and she uh, had gotten uh, some type of fuss uh, with uh, Sarah, and Sarah had booted her out, and she's in the desert about to die now. And the angel of the Lord appears to Hagar. I think this is a real demonstration of the grace of God because the first official ministry affected by the angel of the Lord was to a pagan Egyptian girl. And then this angel appears to Abraham in Genesis chapter 18 and also Genesis chapter 22. We're told that the Lord spoke uh, to Abraham himself and he took upon himself the appearance of a man. And so here is a Christophany. Then he appears to Jacob. Uh, he wrestles with Jacob. And then later on, Jacob himself speaks about this. Jacob says that his angel redeemed me. Here in Genesis chapter 48, he appeared to Moses. Uh, God told him out of a burning bush to take his shoes off, and doubtless that was Jesus because later on we're told that that rock that followed Israel in the wilderness was Christ himself. Then he appears to Joshua. Here he's referred to as the captain of the Lord's host. But this is a Christophany, a pre-Bethlehem appearance of Christ. He appears to Gideon in Judges chapter 6. And then he appeared to Samson's parents in Judges 14. You remember Samson's parents were told about his birth, about Samson's birth, because Manoah and his wife, his wife was barren and they could not have a child. So the angel of the Lord said, you'll have a child. And they were excited and they said, Manoah says, I'll tell you what, stranger, I don't know who you are. You're a very important man, no doubt, a very holy man. I think Manoah did not realize who he was at this time. But he said, if you tell me your name, then when the child is born, we'll call that child after your name. And the angel said, why do you ask my name, seeing as secret? We brought this out before in Isaiah 9, verse 6. The same Hebrew word, uh, root word for secret here in Judges is translated by the word wonderful in Isaiah 9, 6, where Jesus is referred to. Remember, Isaiah says, his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor of the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So there's no doubt about it, Judges... 14 and Isaiah 9, uh, I think, dogmatically teach that the angel of the Lord was Jesus. Well, he appears to Isaiah. Isaiah sees him in Isaiah chapter 6. He appeared to three young Hebrews in the fiery furnace in Daniel 3. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar had thrown them in for their refusal to bow down and worship the golden uh, idol there in the temple or there in the plains of Dura in Babylon. And he said, did not we throw three? And they said, yes. He said, how is it that I see four and the fourth is like unto the Son of God? Then he appeared to Daniel in the lion's den, Daniel 6. Darius asks Daniel after a night of sleeplessness, uh, not on Daniel's part, he had a good night's sleep, but Darius, he was concerned about the safety of his friend Daniel. He said, is your God able to save you whom you serve? And Daniel cried out and said, Live forever, O king. My God has sent his angel and hath clothed the mouth of the lions. And then he appears to Zechariah in several visions, Zechariah 1, Zechariah 2, Zechariah 6, and Zechariah uh, 3. So there are a number of pre-Bethlehem appearances. 
What we're trying to say is this. Our Lord was busily at work even before Bethlehem in the Old Testament. Now we've looked at his preexistence, his Old Testament ministry, and now his virgin birth incarnation, Roman numeral 3. Let me give you some false views about this incarnation of Christ. Number one, there's a group called the Ebionites, and they denied the reality of his divine nature. Uh, they said that, well, actually, these are almost the liberals of today. Uh, they, like the Ebionites, uh, they, uh, uh, they would admit that Jesus was a good teacher and a good man, and perhaps the best man that ever lived. But he certainly was not God any more than what we are, the sons of God, he had that spark of divinity in him, they would say, as we all have that spark, and he just fanned it a little more rapidly, and it, uh, it was a little higher in his heart than in ours. But uh, the Ebonite view is totally erroneous, for Jesus Christ came as God because he was God and not just a good teacher. So then there was the Gnostics. And the Gnostics denied the reality of his human nature. You see, the devil attacked the incarnation from both ends here. There was a group that said, well, his, uh, his humanity was real, but his deity was not. And then there are others who say, well, his deity was real, but his humanity wasn't. And the Gnostics, uh, see, they believed that the, uh, in, in what they would call the inherent uh, evil of materialism. Anything material was evil. And so Jesus, if he were God, he could not have taken himself upon himself a, a, a materialistic body. Of course, the Bible says he did, but the Gnostics would say, no, he didn't. So they would deny his physical nature, whereas the uh, Ebionites would deny his divine nature. And then there was a group called the Arians, and they affirmed his pre-existence. They acknowledged the fact that he did exist and perhaps that he actually uh, created the universe and that he may be used by God to control it, but they denied his deity. And of course, this is the position of the present-day Jehovah Witnesses. The Jehovah Witnesses place Christ as sort of a, a, a brother to Lucifer, of all things. And they say there were some head honchos before God created the world, and there was Christ and Lucifer and Michael and Gabriel, and God then the Father determined to use Christ uh, to uh, come here on earth and be born. This angel, uh, literal angel, as we think of uh, Gabriel being an angel, and he was born on earth. And that is as uh, wicked and unscriptural a doctrine as you'll find anywhere in the world. The Arians are wrong uh, concerning the Incarnation. Then a group called the Nestorians, and E-S-T-O-R-I-A-N-S. -E they believe two persons actually indwelt the body of Christ, the human person and the divine. That's not true. You see, Jesus Christ was one person. He had two natures. He had a divine nature because he was divine. And he had a human nature because he took that nature upon himself. Now, this is one of the greatest mysteries in all the universe. The, and we'll get to this a little later, what the theologian refers to as the hypostatic union. But the Nestorians were wrong. Jesus was not dwelt by two personalities or two persons, one person having two natures. And then there is the group called the Eutychians. E-U-T-Y-C-H-I-A-N-S. And they want the opposite extreme to the Nestorians. And they said that both natures, the human and the divine, mingle to make up a third. And a totally different nature from the original two natures. So you couldn't recognize either the two. And again, that's just as wrong uh, as the Nestorian position. Actually, what the Eutychians would say is this, that... Here's an example of hydrogen and oxygen. And what happens when you take two parts hydrogen, one part, part oxygen? These are two gases, and you put them together, and what happens? You have water. 
you have a third uh, nature or a third thing out of the first two. And of course you can't recognize the third. You don't see the hydrogen, the two parts hydrogen in that water when you drink it or when you swim in it or sail upon it. And uh, you don't see the one part oxygen. Well, that is not right because these two natures uh, did dwell within the body of Christ, but they did not mingle where they could not be divided. That is to say, uh, there are certain statements that Jesus speaks uh, in his human nature. There are certain ones that he speaks through his divine nature. When Jesus said, I thirst, that was the human nature. It was Jesus speaking, but it was through the human nature. When he said, before Abraham was, I am, he was speaking through his divine nature. Now, what is the true view of the incarnation? Here it is, as given by that great theologian, A. H. Strong, in his book, Systematic Theology. He says, in the one person, Jesus Christ, there are two natures, a human nature and a divine nature, each in its completeness and integrity and these two natures are organically and indissolubly united, yet so that no third nature is formed thereby. That is the true view of the incarnation. And thus, and this is exciting to think about, in the Old Testament we have man made in the image of God, and in the New Testament we see God made in the image of God of man. Now what about the miracles involved in the incarnation of Christ? We looked at the false views of the incarnation, the true views. Now what about the miracles? Well, several. The greatest miracle, of course, was this, that God the Son could take upon himself the full nature of man and yet retain the full nature of God. The Bible declares, and we must believe, that he was as much God had he never been man, he was as much man had he never been God. And this is referred to as the hypostatic union. It's a word meaning substance, in like essence. Two natures in one body. Now there's no earthly analogy that can be used to even remotely illustrate this. Certain examples have been offered, but they just don't work. For example, they said, well, what about the relationship in attempting to explain now the two natures of Christ? What about the relationship between the Father and the Son? No, because the Father and the Son do not represent two natures, but two persons. God the Father is a person. God the Son is a person. So that doesn't work. Well, what about the relationship between husband and wife? And again, these are two individuals. What about the relationship between the believer and the Holy Spirit? Again, that's wrong because the Holy Spirit is not the believer and the believer is not the Holy Spirit, even though the Holy Spirit lives within the bosom of the believer. So you're dealing with two people or with two individuals, I should say, in these illustrations, but you do not have two persons in the hypostatic union. You have two natures. Uh, well, what about the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde approach? And again, this is wrong because here you have a split personality and for a while this doctor uh, was a very uh, kind and uh, in the story, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, a very kind uh, individual uh, who uh, was uh, loved by his patients and by a beautiful young girl and that was Dr. Jekyll. And then he took this uh, drink and, and uh, he turned into a vicious monster by the name of Mr. Hyde. So when he was Dr. Jekyll, he wasn't Mr. Hyde. And when he was Mr. Hyde, he laid aside the identity of being Dr. Jekyll. But uh, Jesus Christ was God and man at the same time. So none of these illustrations uh, work, as sincere as they may be given. All right, now one of the other miracles of the Incarnation is that a human body could be conceived within a mother's womb without an earthly father. In fact, 
The miracle of the virgin birth was not the birth of Christ, but it was the conception of Christ's earthly body. See, it was nothing supernatural. Now, hear me carefully. Nothing supernatural about the birth of Christ. Christ was born basically the same way you and I are born. It was the conception of the body of Christ that was the miracle. And furthermore, this conception was not only supernatural, but it was unique, you see, because God had already performed supernatural births for men like, or women like Sarah and Hannah, Elizabeth and others. Uh, God blessed the seed of Abraham uh, within the body of Sarah. Even though Abraham was too old normally to have a child, and certainly uh, Elizabeth was, or uh, Sarah was too old to carry a child. But God supernaturally, after intercourse between the couple, took that seed and united it uh, to, the, to the egg, and then Isaac was born later on. That was a supernatural birth. But the birth of Christ, the conception of Christ, was far more than just supernatural. It was unique. Because here God was bringing uh, a body into this world that was formed in the virgin, uh, in the womb of a virgin. All right, now, the perpetuity of the Incarnation. One of the greatest facts about the story of Bethlehem, the glory story that happened at Christmas, is the perpetuity. That means without end. That means a continual, uh, it means a continuation. Because the body which the Son of God joined himself to at Bethlehem was an eternal arrangement. In other words, he will continue to manifest himself in this body, of course in its resurrected state, throughout all the ages. Now many years ago, well, let's see. I can tell you about how many years. I think uh, it was. we were on our honeymoon, and this must have been April of 1961, and we read uh, the, and heard the thrilling news, of course, of the first Russian uh, astronaut who uh, circled the Earth. And uh, he came down, and, and uh, this was even before we had gotten a spaceship up, actually, let alone a manned spaceship. And so when he came back, uh, they uh, interviewed him, and he was from an atheistic country, Russia, of course. And so he said, well, he said, I've proven that God does not exist. I've been around the earth three times and I didn't see him. And uh, I think the President of the United States has suggested at that time that he search a little higher. Maybe he didn't go high enough. But, but uh, at any rate, uh, you know, uh, it, was, it would be theoretically possible, I suppose, for him to have seen an actual body. I don't know what he was looking for, maybe uh, Edward G. Robinson with, you know, a father time type uh, character, but somewhere, what we're saying is this, somewhere in the universe, right now and throughout all eternity, there is a glorified body with nail-scarred hands and a jagged hole in the side and pierced feet belonging to the Lord Jesus Christ, the perpetuity of the Incarnation. And what a manifestation of the love and grace of God. Now, we've looked at the pre-existence and the Old Testament ministry. We're finishing up the virgin birth incarnation, the prophecies concerning the Incarnation. Uh, did this catch Israel off guard? In a way it did, <clears throat> but it should not have, because it was prophesied at least, at least 4,000 years before it took place. Uh, Genesis 3.15, it was prophesied. And Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, <clears throat> and his name will be called Emmanuel. Isaiah 9, verse 6, speaking of <clears throat> the names of Christ. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor of the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, 
the Prince of Peace, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, actually gave the city where this miracle would take place, Bethlehem. And then in the New Testament, Zacharias learns about it as he uh, gives a praise to God, an inspired praise of God uh, at, the, at the birth of his son, John the Baptist. And he speaks of this boy going before God, uh, preparing the way of the king. So Zacharias knew something about this incarnation. Certainly Mary did. Uh, Gabriel appears to Mary and tells her that she has found favor among women and God is going to allow her the privilege of bearing the Messiah into the world. And then to Elizabeth the cousin of Mary. When Mary visits Elizabeth, the Spirit of God reveals that to her. You can read that in Luke 1. And then the Joseph, the distraught uh, would-be husband of Mary. And he thought that his wife had been immoral. And the angel Gabriel says, don't be afraid to take this uh, Mary as your wife because that holy thing born within her. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And of course the shepherds learned of this incarnation in Luke 2. For unto you the angels tell them, in the city of David is born this day a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And then the wise men, it took them a couple years to get there, but they heard of the incarnation, the birth of the King of the Jews. And then to Simeon, an old man in Luke 2, been waiting for the consolation of Israel. And he saw Jesus before he died, and he asked God to allow him to depart in peace, for his eyes had seen the Savior of Israel. And then to an old woman also, along with Simeon, was waiting for the incarnation to be announced. Her name was Anna. So there was at least eight references here that we can give you concerning the scriptures of the relating to the incarnation, the prophecies. Now, what about some reasons for the incarnation? Why did Jesus Christ have to come? And it was necessary for him that he came. Well, number one, to reveal the invisible God. I think it was D.O. Moody that told this story, this illustration. I suppose it has, it's so old, it probably has whiskers longer than Moody's on it, but if you haven't heard it, let me tell it to you, and if you have, it would be good to listen again, of a young biology student making his way along the forest path one day, and he saw an anthill. So he sat down and took out a pencil and paper and began to draw pictures of these ants and making notes, and he was interested in biology and, and zoology, and so he uh, made a study, was making a study, and, and these ants, uh, they're certainly a very intelligent creature, uh, even though they're so tiny, and they soon became aware of this gigantic mountain of human flesh standing over them, and so they were running helter-skelter and, and dropping their burdens that they were carrying and running in and out of holes, and, and soon he had disrupted the entire activity of the anthill. And uh, in the story, the young man uh, thought to himself, I wish I could somehow convey a message to these little ants, uh, letting them know that uh, I have no harm in my heart toward them, uh, no animosity. I could stomp them and, and kill them, but I, I, I want to know more about them. And, and he concluded, of course, it would be impossible, but he, would, he supposed the only way to convey that message would be for him to take upon himself the body of an ant and to learn ant communication and to walk and talk among ants and tell them his story in the story of human concern in ant language. Now that's exactly why Jesus came. He said, no man has seen the uh, God at any time, but the uh, Son of God has revealed him. Uh, God loved the world, and how could he get his message across? So in the fullness of time, Christ, who was God, became and is God, became man and told God's story in man's language. This is literally the invasion 
from outer space to reveal the invisible God. The second reason for the incarnation was to fulfill prophecy. Genesis 3:15, the first promise of Bethlehem, way back there in the garden, the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent to fulfill prophecy. Thirdly, to guarantee the Davidic covenant. In 2 Samuel 7, God gives David a very precious promise. David is discouraged at this time. He had wanted to build the temple, but God told him he would not be able to build the temple. He was a man of war, and God was going to allow his son Solomon to build the temple, but God says, I'll give you something far more precious than the ability or the privilege of building a temple. And he gives him what we call, or what the theologian refers to as the Davidic covenant. And what it said was this, that in the, in the uh, future sometime, a uh, child will be born uh, from the seed of David, the tribe of Judah, that would someday rule over not only the temple, but all the land of Israel in a righteous reign. And in Luke chapter 1, one of the first things that the angel Gabriel reminded Mary of after he told her about the birth of Christ, the incarnation, was the, this would be the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. So uh, David was promised a ruler from his seed, and the incarnation now guaranteed that would be fulfilled. And then to make a sacrifice for our sins. To make a sacrifice for our sins. Hebrews 2, 9, He, by the grace of God, tasted death for every man. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verses 4 and 5, uh, For it is not possible, the Bible says, that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, here are the first recorded words of Jesus, by the way, as he left ivory, the ivory palaces of heaven and came down uh, to this world as he entered the womb of Mary. Uh, sacrifice and offering, he says to the Father, thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. So one of the purposes of the incarnation, of course, was to make a sacrifice for our sins. And then verse 12, we're told in Hebrews 10, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God. All right. Another reason for the incarnation was to reconcile man to God. Again, going back to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17. Wherefore, we're told in all things that behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to make reconciliation for the sins of his people. And then in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19, Paul reminds us that we, that God was in Christ reconciling the word unto himself. All right, at this point, I'm told we have about a minute left, and so we'll conclude lecture number one.